Welcome to Eva and her extended family. Uh, here we are, the Royal Irish Academy, at the launch of Soldiers of Liberty. I'm Anthony Farrell, the Pride Publisher. I will say a few words and introduce our guest speaker, and Eva will then reply and wrap up the proceedings. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. From the Protestant Enlightenment ideals of individual liberty and an indivisible united country, articulated by Wolf Tone, John Curran, Robert Emmett, and others on the streets, courthouses, and scaffolds of Dublin and Belfast, to the wretched spectacle of today's European Brexit negotiations, there's been an unbroken chain of human endeavor that's come to define our Irish island nation over the past 220 years. This very academy predates this and is indeed an outgrowth of those ideals through its repository and preservation of historic texts and in its standards of scholarship. When as a child I published over the, I puzzled over the prefix royal attached both to here and the Irish Automobile Club across the road where we country members took lunch on our forays to Dublin my Protestant Ulster mother pointed out that Ireland had had kings long before the larger island across the water had theirs. Anyhow, we're in the perfect location in which to present a work such as Eva and Cahors' Soldiers of Liberty, a book that chronicles a vital stepping stone in the chain of events that leads us up to today and into the future. For it was the 1858 Fenian movement that formulated in the oath-bound Irish Republican Brotherhood of rural post-famine Ireland and North America and forged a direct link to the men and women of 1916 and to the birth of modern Ireland as we now know it. Anyhow, to complicate this ladybird reading of our past, Lilliput is now honoured to welcome our leading great famine historian to put some flesh on the bones of Eva's magisterial keynote work, Cormac O'Drada, Emeritus Professor at UCD, Princeton and beyond. This is a great pleasure, um, and this is a great book, so uh, I, I, I'm delighted to be asked by, by Anthony to, to do the honours. Uh, I have a bit of a text here, uh, which I'll more or less stick to, and it doesn't go on for too long. Um, this is a book about a, a somewhat controversial uh, group of people, because Fenianism's place uh, in our history is contested and controversial and uh, to some embarrassing. It's also full of contradictions. The Fenians were at once conspiratorial and attention-seeking, prone to cock-ups and resilient in recovering from them, uh, sometimes seemingly gone but never really forgotten. Um, terroristic in their methods but popular and democratic in their broad appeal. In the popular imagination, Fenian's story is one of splits and conspiracies, fiascos and funerals. And there is ample evidence for all of this in Soldiers of Liberty, this really terrific book. In Soldiers of Liberty, and I, I did the count, uh, the word split occurs 33 times. <laughs> and that is not counting the Parnell split. There are over 80 references to conspiracies, 30 to plots, 16 to disasters, 34 to collapse, 61 to rescue, and 58 to funeral. And that is excluding index references. The witty reference on page 257 to a rescue and two funerals is a familiar part of the story. Because the Fenians did funerals like the British do royal weddings. Uh, they first attracted national attention through the funeral of Terence Daniel McManus in 1861, 
And they could still muster a massive crowd when they buried Ronan Rasa in 1915. In between, the Fenians honored John O'Mahony with a public funeral in 1877, small, admittedly, relative to the McManus funeral, but still featuring 44 marching bands. James Stevens got a huge funeral in 1901. One of the dozens of wreaths being from Michael, and it says, Michael Davitt in memory of the old captain. And in 1907, John O'Leary was given yet another impressive send-off. Although, as Professor Joe Lee quipped memorably long ago, not even Fenianism can live by funerals alone. <laughs> in recent years, there has been somewhat of a reawakening uh, of interest in the Fenians. But this panoramic survey is the first comprehensive scholarly account of the movement, from its secretive beginnings on St. Patrick's Day, 1858, to enigmatic end uh, in the mid-1920s. Rejecting depictions of Fenianism as just fun or a way of finding one's way in the world, Eva succeeds pretty convincingly in showing that an older generation of historians underestimated the people she calls the soldiers of liberty and their commitment, as in the end, the authorities did. And it also shows that the Fenians, more than any movement that went before, were made up of the plain people of Ireland. Yes, it's easy to sneer at and ridicule the Fenians, but what Ava has succeeded in doing is asking us to take them seriously. Of course, Fenianism has its darker terroristic side. You only have to think of Clerkenwell, think of Donovan Ross's skirmishing fund, but its popular appeal and enduring resilience and in the end, its enormous influence on popular culture and political events cannot be denied. And some of us would think, in the end, was not a bad thing. The Fenians were first mentioned in the Irish Times on the 20th of October, 1863, as, and I quote, a mysterious political society called the Fenian, Fenian, or Fenian Brotherhood, whose members were all Irishmen and whose objects were the invasion of Ireland and the establishment of an Irish Republic. It refers to Limerick man John O'Mahony as head centre. For some years thereafter, the Fenians often grabbed the headlines, but in terms of newspaper coverage, their heyday was over by the early 1870s. In 1879, a meeting of Fenians in Manchester passed a resolution declaring, and here I'm quoting, that the Brotherhood is not extinct, although a number of their brethren have departed from them under the fear of ecclesiastic censure. There was a blip in the early 1880s, partly linked to the Phoenix Park murders. Between then and 1916, the Fenians, under various names, never quite faded from the page, but as time went on, the references tended to be to the deaths and funerals of elderly Fenians. The late Theo Moody uh, of TCD, a Quaker and thus a convinced pacifist, had his own original take on the Fenians. He liked to see both what they achieved and failed to achieve as a vindication of pacifism. While conceding that, and I quote, this physical force movement impact on all on Irishmen of all shades of nationalist opinion was profound and far-reaching. He insisted that, and again I'm quoting him here, only vital conquests, the only vital conquests it made were in the realm of the spirit. In the end, Moody 